week, Will Vike will be here. Will. Will's in the crowd. But I will not be here. I will be in Alaska. I will try to tune in like I did when I was in Belgium, but we'll see what we can do. Sandy and Tom have agreed to take Will out for beers afterwards. Anybody here would like to go for beer afterwards? Where do we go? The library. Will's going to get in shape so he can, yes. Will's going to be talking about snakes around town, baseline snake species occupancy, and Madison area prairie restorations. Are you going to bring any live snakes with you? They're all out of the prairie. We can help you find one. <laughs> okay. um, I'm looking forward to this talk, even though I won't be here. In two weeks, Jesse Weber from Integrative Biology will be here to talk about how a fish lost and then regained its worm. Evolutionary genetics of host parasite interactions. And this worm is not an earthworm, it's a uh, parasitic worm. So that'll be fun. On August 17th, probably at the hottest week of the summer, Matthew Lazaro from Space Science and Engineering will be here to talk about observing the extremes of Antarctic weather and climate. And Matthew has been all over the continent of Antarctica with his various uh, meteorological stations. We're in for a great talk. So I think that's good stuff so far. Any questions from anybody? All right. Thanks for coming tonight. I'm a new formal version. I'm going to ask you five questions. Okay. You'll be able to handle them. Welcome, everybody, to Wednesday Night at the Lab. I'm Tom Zinnan. I work here at the UW Madison Biotechnology Center. I also work for uh, the Division of Extension Wisconsin 4 H. And on behalf of those folks and our other co organizers, PBS Wisconsin, the Wisconsin Alumni Association, and the UW Madison Science Alliance, thanks again for coming to Wednesday Night at the Lab. We do this every Wednesday night, 50 times a year. Tonight's my pleasure to introduce to you Dennis Halterman. He's with the U.S. Department of Agriculture's Agriculture Research Service and their Vegetable Crops Research Unit here at UW-Madison. Dennis, I'm gonna ask, oh, you're gonna be talking about building a better potato, fighting diseases at the molecular level. Dennis, here come the five questions. All right. Where were you born? I was born in Coal City, Illinois, about 60 miles southwest of Chicago. On beautiful route, Illinois, 47. Yes. Close to that. Yeah. Okay, close enough. <laughs> and then where'd you go to high school? Same place, Coal City, Illinois, home of the Kohlers. <laughs> Coal City is right next to Diamond and Carbon Hill. If you can sense a theme here. And these are not pit mines, right? They were underground mines. Is that correct? There were some were strip mines. Some there were some. Underground. Okay. Yeah. Well, yeah. I remember seeing the big piles of slag mm -hmm. going by too. And then where'd you go for your undergrad and what did you study? I went to Cornell College where I studied biology and biochemistry. And that's Cornell College in Mount Vernon, Iowa. Iowa. Way to go. And then where'd you go for your advanced degrees? And what did you study? I went to Purdue University in West Lafayette, Indiana for my PhD, and then went on to a postdoc after that at with the USDA ARS and at Iowa State University. All right. So you have stayed in the cluster of the right along I-80, my yes. entire life almost. Unbelievable. You know? I feel your pain. <laughs> I mean, it is a wonderful <laughs> place to grow up because I grew up in Dixon, Illinois, and that's I-88, which is yeah. like 80 only plus eight. And then when did you come to Madison? 2004. So it's been 18 years. All right. Uh, as I mentioned in my little missive uh, this week, I have a maternal grandmother whose name is Cunningham. I'm guessing at least part of her clan got here because of, in part because of the Irish potato famine. I know you're going to talk about more than a little bit about that. Yep. Phytophthora intestines, but uh, this is something near and dear to my heart as a plant pathologist. Looking forward to your talk. Would you please join me in welcoming Dennis Halterman to Wednesday Night Lab? Hi, Thanks, everyone. 
it's good to see everybody in person again and wonderful to have everybody online joining us. Um, a couple of things uh, I want to point out on the title slide. So obviously we're going to be talking about potatoes tonight almost exclusively. But uh, if you're a Twitter user, this is my my Twitter handle, Halterman Lab. Uh, feel free to tweet about it if I did a good job. If not, you can keep it to yourselves, I guess. Um, something else, a strange thing in the bottom right. Um, so I happen to be a little bit hard of hearing. And so at, at meetings and conferences and stuff, it's always been a little bit difficult for me to, to hear people's questions after the talk. And so I'm always trying to find out new ways to engage the audience and make it a, a nice experience for everyone. So I'm trying this out. If, if you want to ask questions, if you're online or if you're here in person, we can do it the traditional way. You can put things in chat or you can ask your question or you can go to slido.com and type in the keyword potato or you can take a picture of the QR code there. It will take you there. And then you can go and enter your questions and it'll show up on my phone at some point and I can read them and um, address them then. All right. So I, I got my five questions, but I want to give a little bit more background about myself. So uh, I grew up in North Central Illinois. As I told Tom, um, my parents were, were both uh, school teachers, science and math. And I, I worked uh, on my extended family farm, uncles and grandparents. And so I think that combination of science and agriculture really drove me forward in, in a career in in agriculture and science. My undergraduate degree, I mentioned I went to Cornell College, the one in Iowa, which is actually founded before the one in Ithaca. I like to tell people whenever I get a chance. And what's interesting about Cornell is we, we took uh, a one course at a time. So they started this back in the late 70s. So you take one class for three and a half weeks, you have a few days off, and you take a next class. Um, we do that eight times during the year. And I, I really enjoyed the ability to focus, especially on science classes, without any other distractions. You'd have a lecture in the morning and lab in the afternoon, typically. And it really fostered my sense of, of really diving into science and being able to uh, engage myself with the class. And then my PhD and postdoc, I worked on molecular mechanisms of disease resistance that we'll get into a little bit more tonight. And then, as I said, I've been here since uh, 2004 with the USDA ARS. Uh, and I'm on campus at UW in the Department of Plant Pathology right now. And I'm also a member of uh, Team Potato. So yes, there is such a thing. Uh, it's a fitness team that was put together by Potatoes USA, kind of the marketing arm of the potato industry here in the US. And that was just put together in 2020. So we're fairly new. If you're interested in joining, I invite you to, to join up uh, by going to teampotato.com. And so how did I end up here? Well, uh, myself and colleagues within the USDA and Department of Horticulture and Plant Pathology have participated over the years in uh, outreach activities here on campus at UW-Madison. And one of these, or a couple of these, are the Science Festival and the Science Expeditions. And this past uh, event in April, Tom came around and was so enthralled with, with everything we were doing and talking about that he said, you must come and talk at uh, Wednesday night at the lab. So I said, sure, why not? Um, any chance to talk about potatoes? Hopefully I won't bore you too much, but um, I really enjoy talking about the work that we do and the impact it can have on, on the potato industry. So before I get into talking about research and potatoes, I wanna make sure that I acknowledge people who do a lot of the work and who are current and past members of my lab. So uh, here on the left is kind of the current makeup of my lab. Uh, we have uh, Michaela, who's a technician, a couple undergrads, uh, Heidi and Aya, and a postdoc, Mercedes. And then uh, a couple of former postdocs, Hari Karki and Sidrat Abdullah, who uh, did some of the work that I'll talk about tonight. And another undergraduate, uh, Josh, who is doing, uh, working on a project that's a collaboration between myself and Orly Rakatandrafara in the Department of Plant Pathology. And of course, the funding. Um, I work for the USDA, so my salary and, and some of my research funds comes directly from the USDA, but it's not typically enough to carry out uh, a, a normal 
research lab. So we were reliant on getting some outside funding. And so uh, we're fortunate to get some funding from the Wisconsin Potato and Vegetable Growers Association, uh, USDA National Institute for Food and Agriculture, and some competitive grants throughout through USDA and also NSF and of course, the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And so uh, the research in my lab wouldn't be possible if I didn't have space on the University of Wisconsin-Madison campus. And I wanna make sure that I also acknowledge that the campus occupies ancestral Ho-Chunk land um, in a place that they call Jajope. Uh, and they were forced to cede this territory in a treaty with the US government in 1832. And that was followed by several decades of ethnic cleansing. And I think it's important that we acknowledge um, the circumstances that led to the removal of these native people from the land and honor their resilience and their guidance and caring for the land so that future generations can prosper. So tonight we're gonna to talk about potato. So I want everyone to close your eyes for a second. I think we're early enough in the talk we're not gonna put anybody to sleep. So close your eyes and think about the first thing that comes to your mind when I say the word potato. All right. You can open your eyes now. So a lot of you, if you're like me, before I started working on potato exclusively, you probably saw this, something like this. Uh, a potato uh, it could be white, could be russet, could be red. But, you know, you think of a potato, you can hold it in your hand. That's what you're having for dinner. Um, other people may think of a baked potato loaded with sour cream and toppings. Uh, others may think of French fries, potato chips, other ways to eat potatoes. And if you're young at heart, maybe you have our friend, Mr. Potato Head in your mind. Um, none of you would be wrong, although could debate whether Mr. Potato Head is actually a potato or not. Um, these are all potatoes. And you know, before I started working on potatoes exclusively, these were all the thing, images that would come to my mind when I thought about potato. But now that I've been working on it a, a lot more, this is what I envision when I when people talk about potato or when I uh, when people say potato, the whole plant, everything that goes with it. Uh, and of course, there's a lot of science related to this plant and this crop. Of course, the leaves, they're important for photosynthesis. Uh, they make sugars, turns that into starches, that goes down to the tubers, and they um, fill up the tubers. Uh, obviously, the leaves are an important entry point for a lot of microbes or pathogens that can cause diseases. The stems also can get infected. They hold up the plant. Uh, they transport nutrients and liquids throughout the plant. Stolons and roots. So stolons are specialized underground stems that actually form the potato tubers. So a lot of people are surprised to learn that the potato itself, the tuber, is not a root. It's actually an underground stem uh, that's a specialized part of the plant. But of course, potato does have roots and they have play an important part with water and nutrient uptake. Um, they feed the rest of the plant. Another uh, part of the plant that isn't really recognized much with potato are the flowers and the fruit. So a lot of people are surprised to realize that potatoes actually make fruit. Um, from a production standpoint, the fruit aren't really all that important. The flowers aren't that important. But if you go uh, through central Wisconsin in, in June, you look off to the side of I-39, you can see fields of potatoes that are flowering with white, uh, purple, pink flowers. They're really quite beautiful. Um, and of course, they aren't important for production necessarily, but they're very important for geneticists and uh, breeders like myself who want to develop new varieties or make crosses with different potato related species to try to introduce new traits or genetics. We need to use the pollen from one flower and uh, pollinate uh, another flower so that you can make fruit and these seeds. And that's what we actually use in our research. But of course, the potato tuber is one of the most important important parts of the potato. I threw up this, this image because it is an image of a sprouting tuber to make people understand or realize that it's not just the tuber, the tuber isn't just what we use for food. We also use that uh, for planting the next year. So these tubers are kept throughout the winter, then they're cut up and all of the eyes make sprouts. And that's what actually grows into the new plant in your garden or out in the field. <clears throat> 
So you may look at these, these fruit of potato, if you've never seen them before, and say, well, that looks a little bit like a cherry tomato, and you wouldn't be too far off. So potato is in the same family of plants as tomato, pepper, eggplant, tobacco. Um, they're all in the Solanaceae family, which also includes nightshade. So uh, you know nightshade, of course, makes a lot of very toxic compounds in its fruit. Uh, potato, because it hasn't been selected for the fruit, also contains a lot of toxic compounds. Tomato, pepper, eggplant, they've all been bred to remove a lot of those compounds so they don't make you sick when you actually eat them. If you ate a potato fruit, it would make you quite ill, I think. I wouldn't recommend that. So show of hands, who here has eaten potatoes within the last week? <laughs> yeah. So just about everybody. Um, and that's that's great. Keep it up. <laughs> so um, that's pretty normal. Uh, a survey put out by the Potatoes USA says that 76% of people have eaten potatoes uh, within the past week. And that's great. Uh, because they're they're good for you. Uh, uh, a medium sized potato, about three and a half ounces, is uh, a decent amount of calories. Uh, has no fat, no cholesterol, no sodium, unless you put a little salt on it, like I like to. Uh, and it has a, a fairly good amount of fiber and protein in it too. One thing people don't realize about potato is that it's an excellent source of potassium. So it has more potassium than a banana, which is well known for its potassium content. It also has a decent amount of vitamin C, not as much as a citrus plant, of course, or citrus fruit, but uh, good vitamin C. And potatoes, I've been told, is one of the only foods that you could eat exclusively and not get sick. Um, I think a five-year-old might argue that dino bites or chicken nuggets would fall into that category too. But um, in fact, you could eat potatoes and get all the nutrition you need to survive. In fact, um, a former president of the Washington State Potato Commission in 2010, I think, went on an endeavor to eat only potatoes for two months. And that's what he did. He had a little oil to, to help cook them, but ate potatoes, uh, breakfast, lunch, and dinner for two months. And you know what happened? He didn't die. Yeah. He actually got healthier. Uh, he lost some weight. His cholesterol went down. Uh, his blood chemistry stayed the same or got better. Um, so you can survive entirely on potatoes. And this is what uh, people in Ireland did in the, the early 1800s. They ate potatoes exclusively, maybe a little bit of butter or milk from a cow, but uh, that was their main, main diet main source of nutrition. So where are potatoes produced in the US? So all of these states in green uh, have commercial potato production in them. A lot of people are surprised to find out that Wisconsin uh, is actually number three in the US for potato production. So there's Idaho, Washington state, and then Wisconsin down below, but we're a fairly, fairly firm third place. Uh, we have been for the past so, couple decades. How do we typically eat our potatoes? Well, most of it's French fries and potato chips. So frozen potato products, French fries, um, hash browns, tater tots, uh, account for about 40% of the potatoes that we eat. And potato chips are another 23%. But about a quarter of the potatoes we eat are fresh market, which you'd buy in the grocery store, take home and eat mashed potatoes, boiled potatoes, roasted potatoes, that sort of thing. And then a few others, dehydrated products and refrigerated products and canned products to, to round out the rest. So potato research in Wisconsin, because we're way up there, uh, number three in the US, we do a fair amount of research on campus here at university. Um, probably have on the order of 15 or so labs or scientists who work on different aspects of potato research. Um, we have uh, germplasm collection up in Sturgeon Bay, Wisconsin, uh, on Door, in Door County. And that is where they uh, maintain 
a lot of the wild species relatives of potato. And we'll get into a little bit of where they come from, but it's important that we keep that as a source of diversity for the genetics and a lot of the work that myself and my colleagues do. We have scientists who work on germ germplasm enhancement, uh, increasing or, or enhancing the flavor, the color, texture of potato, um, incorporating disease resistance and, and coming up with uh, sources of germplasm that breeders can use to improve potato varieties. Physiologists who work on storing potatoes. So when you harvest them in the fall, you need to keep them alive basically for an entire year so you can plant them next year. Uh, we also wanna make potato chips and things in July of the next year. So it's really important to do a lot of research on, on storing those potatoes so that the starch stays stable and they don't doesn't turn into sugars because sugars when you cook them can make potatoes really dark and get dark chips and dark fries, which is undesirable. And, and looking at different nutrient uptake and stress responses. Potatoes, fortunately for me, but unfortunate for potatoes, are very susceptible to a lot of different diseases. And so there's a, a fair amount of research here in Wisconsin, but throughout the U.S. looking at uh, disease resistance. And we'll get into more of that tonight. And, and scientists who study the production of potato, how to grow them, you know, how far apart to put the plants, uh, when to plant them, when to harvest them, that sort of thing. And disease and, and weed and storage management all fall, falls under that category. And soils, you know, how much water to, to put in the soil, how much fertilizer is also important of managing, important point, part of managing potato production. Seeds, seed certification. So the seed that we take and put into the field for the next year, we want to make sure that's clean from diseases. And so we have scientists who study not only how to keep them clean, but to test them to make sure that they stay clean uh, for the next year. And of course, marketing to make sure people eat more potatoes. And so, as I mentioned, we're going to talk more about disease resistance almost exclusively for the rest of uh, tonight, because that's what I really enjoy doing. So a little bit about potato history. So well, I talked about wild species relatives of potato. They're probably on the order of about 100 different species relatives of potato that grow in Central America and South America. And they uh, are quite diverse. They don't look like anything like a potato that we grow in the field here. And um, they make really small tubers that you wouldn't want to eat. They could make you quite sick. They're really bitter tasting. Um, and they have a lot of compounds that are kind of a defense mechanism for the potato so that animals and insects don't eat them. It makes us not want to eat them too. But they're uh, an excellent source of genetic variation. So they're, they're existing out in very harsh environments sometimes, in deserts, in dry mountains, in jungles, in coastlines, um, places where plants wouldn't normally be able to survive. But these are surviving like weeds, basically, in all of these, these different environments. And so they're out there existing without fertilizer, without irrigation, without pesticides. Um, they're able to defend themselves and, and hold their own. And so when we're trying to study potatoes to incorporate those various traits into cultivated potato, these wild species are an excellent source of a genetic variation that we can use to identify, or try to understand why they're drought resistant, why they're disease resistant. And by understanding that, we can improve the potato varieties that we grow for food. So in the, the late 1500s, explorers from, from Spain uh, explored the New World and South America and came across these people who were eating these really strange looking things that they dig up from the ground and they were a little bit bitter tasting, um, but they were eating them for food and they were quite intrigued. And so they they um, brought them back to, to Europe. We call these now land races. So they are, they're not wild species. They're not fully cultivated potato like we grow here in the US. They're kind of a mix. Um, and what happened when they brought them over to Europe 
is that a lot of these potatoes that were adapted to growing in very high altitudes or very near the equator under long day length, a lot of them didn't grow very well when they brought them over to Europe. So we have this, what we call a genetic bottleneck where um, a lot of those potatoes either didn't survive or they didn't make any tubers that people could use for food. And so there were really only a few different uh, species or varieties that, that existed at that point. Um, and so that genetic variation went from very large to a very, very narrow sliver of, of what we have available for potato. And then from there, they went through the rest of Europe and Northern Africa and China, and they grew these adapted varieties that they could use for food in these different locations. And then at some point in the early 1600s, they were brought over back to the United States where they were grown as crops along the Eastern coast for, for a number of years, for a couple hundred years, uh, very successfully. But then uh, sometime in the, the early mid 1800s, uh, a disease called blight uh, likely came up from central Mexico and moved into potato fields within the Eastern US. And these plants were completely decimated within a year or two. Um, yields went down to almost nothing. Potatoes rotted, they just kind of melted away in the field. And then of course, potatoes, since they were an important food source, would often be brought along on ships. And eventually these blighted potatoes made their way over to, to Europe in 1844 and did the same thing over there. They spread throughout the potato uh, agriculture and decimated those crops. And that is essentially what set off or what contributed to the Irish potato famine that led to uh, starvation related illnesses and death of uh, a million Irish farmers and uh, emigration of another million or more uh, people from Ireland at that time, because they were existing on potatoes solely. So when they lost their food source, they not only lost, you know, income, they lost their ability to uh, have the sufficient caloric intake to stay healthy. So potato late blight, we're going to focus a lot on that tonight, because it's one of my favorite diseases. And it's what I've been working on. Uh, primarily since I, I joined here in 2004. So potato late blights, it's, it's caused by an oomycete uh, called Phytophthora infestans. So it, it grows like a fungus, it looks like a fungus, but it's definitely not a fungus. So we're more, more closely related to a fungus than, than oomycetes are. Oomycetes are more closely related to diatoms and algae and water molds. Um, they, they like cool, wet environments, typically. Uh, they form these sporangia, these oval-shaped things that uh, encapsulate uh, a number of these, what we call zoospores, that are flagellated. So once they have the right conditions, wet conditions, they can swim around in water droplets or mist and spread throughout um, fields or in the soil if it's wet enough and spread very easily. And so in the matter of probably a week, you could go from one infected plant to wiping out an entire field. It uh, happens very quickly if the environment's right. But we fortunately have some disease resistance or immunity available in these wild species that have been co-evolving or coexisting with late blight for thousands of years. Um, this species called Solanum demissum was, was used for many years as a source of resistance genes. It contains 11, at least 11 resistance genes that were used for breeding disease resistant potatoes for many years. But uh, now um, they've all been overcome. So we'll talk about how the process of overcoming resistance happens a little bit later. But potato late blight um, is, is well known for its ability to overcome or break down resistance once it's been released to the field. And potato late blight, even though it's it's been around for you know hundreds of years, it still remains a persistent problem in, in US agriculture and world potato agriculture. Uh, we don't have as much of a problem here in the US as, as Europe and some other places in the world. And you may have 
if you paid very close attention back in 2009 and 2010, there was an incident where potato late blight, new strains from, from Mexico moved up uh, throughout the US and really replaced those strains that were commonly found here. Um, and so, but we still have sources of resistance available to us. And so a lot of the work that I do and colleagues do is look at these wild species relatives of potato and try to identify new sources of resistance. And so one species that we'll talk about more tonight is uh, Solanum bulbocustanum that contains very strong resistance to late blight. So I wanna give an introduction to plant pathology. Um, of course, plants get sick. Uh, they get sick from a lot of the same things that make us sick, viruses, bacteria, fungi. Um, and these are just some examples. Uh, of course, these are all potatoes. Uh, this is potato late blight. This is potato soft rot caused by a bacteria. This is uh, early blight caused by uh, alternaria solani, a fungus. This is potato leaf roll. So the theme here is that uh, plant pathologists aren't really all that creative in the names that we come up with when we, when we see certain diseases. You know, it's like, okay, well, the leaf's rolling, so we'll call that leaf roll virus. Um, and this is blight, it comes on early, so we'll call it early blight. And this is rotten, so we'll call it rotten. And this is, um, yeah, Colorado potato beetle, potato virus rye. Um, this is common scab. You might see that a lot in your gardens caused by a bacteria. And this is uh, nematodes. So this is actually a worm that will infect uh, the roots of, of plants, in this case, potatoes. And this is uh, dry rot caused by uh, a fungus fusarium. So a tenant or, you know, a, a basic uh, paradigm of plant pathology is this idea that we need to have a few different specific factors in order to get plant disease. We call this the plant disease triangle. Uh, of course, we need a pathogen. We need something that can cause a disease. Uh, we need a plant. We need a host, something that can get infected. And we also need the right environment that allows the pathogen to grow and the host to grow and the right environment for that disease to be caused. And in, in the research that we do uh, in the greenhouse, in the laboratory, in growth chambers, we can manipulate all the different aspects of this disease triangle. We can you know, inoculate our plants with different strains of the, the microbe. We can change up what plants we're inoculating to get disease, and we can control the environment. We can control the temperature, the lighting, that sort of thing. But out in the field, in your garden, or you know, out in the wild, we're not able to control a lot of this as easily as we'd like to. Uh, the pathogen, we can't really control what pathogens are out there. We can, that's not exactly true. We can, we can apply fungicides and things to kind of knock down the pathogen load and uh, control a little bit what's out there, but we can't control what comes in from the wind or from a neighbor's field, that sort of thing. Um, the environment, we can control a little bit by with irrigation or fertilizer, that sort of thing, but we can't control whether it's going to be a cloudy day or a sunny day or a really hot day or cold day, rainy, whatever. Um, and so these we can't really control. The only thing we can control is the host. So what varieties we put out into the field. And so the work that I do in my laboratory looks primarily at the host and how it interacts with the pathogen uh, and try to develop new hosts that we can put out into the field that are better at resisting disease progression. And we do that at by studying this interaction at the molecular level. So um, inside a plant cell or you know, right around a single plant cell, we're looking at how the plant and the pathogen interact with one another to cause disease. And we'll get into a little more specifics of that. So, you know, molecular plant pathology, this is, you know, a graduate level class that we talk about for a semester long. And we've got 
you know, 10 minutes here or so to give you a crash course. So I'm going to throw out a few terms and then I like to use analogies to kind of talk about this whole process and it seems to work out pretty well. So um, if you look outside, you'll see most plants, they're still nice and green, right? You might find some disease on them if you look really closely, but for the most part, they're fairly resistant. And that's because they, they contain some inherent mechanism that allows them to resist a lot of the microbes that are constantly bombarding them. You know, there's bacteria, there's fungus, there's all kinds of stuff landing on them all the time, but they're able to kind of fight off or defend themselves against a lot of these microbes. The difference between a microbe and a pathogen that can cause disease is that pathogens have evolved tools and a toolbox that allows them to manipulate or change the plant so that it makes it a better living environment. And they do this primarily by expressing or turning off these basic or basal defense responses that are in plants. And by doing that, they can go on then to cause disease and grow and get the nutrients that, that they need. And they use uh, these tools, these tools we call uh, effectors. So they have an effect on the plant host. And most of these are proteins that are used as I mentioned, to, to modify the plant and suppress these defense responses and cause disease. And then plants have evolved ways of recognizing the presence of these effectors and turning on, turning on a much stronger and longer lasting defense response. And we call these resistance proteins. So how are these plant defenses activated? So, this is the analogy I was talking about. So imagine yourself at home, you're relaxing at night, reading a book, watching TV, and you look outside and you see something a little suspicious. Um, you're not sure exactly what's going on, but you're, you're sure it's, it's not quite right. So what might you do? Um, you might do pretty simple things. You lock your door, turn on the outside lights, or if you're a good neighbor, you might call up your neighbor and say, yeah, keep a lookout. There's, not, there's something not quite right going on outside. Um, or if things get a little more serious, you might call the police to come and check it out. Plants essentially do something very similar. Um, you know, they, they're able to recognize the presence of microbes. Uh, they're able to defend themselves or just kind of turn on some slight alert that says something's not quite right. They may send a signal to other leaves. If one's getting chewed on, it might send a signal and say, well, look out, there's these insects around. Um, but for the most part, they don't do a whole lot, um, very similar to this. So these microbes then, how, how do they cause disease? How, how are they becoming pathogens? Well, I mentioned they have tools in their toolbox that allow them to kind of unlock locked doors, or they may be very stealthy like a ninja and just avoid detection entirely. Or in some cases, they can be a little more active and actually actively suppress defense responses that are, that are going on. And they do that using what I mentioned, these, these proteins called effectors. And effectors are present in all different plant pathogens, whether it's a fungus or mycete or insect, uh, an animal like a worm or bacteria, viruses, they all produce these effectors. And this is a plant cell drawing. And these effectors make work on the outside of the plant cell. And a lot of times they're actually inserted or injected or introduced inside the plant cell itself, where they're interacting with different proteins or signals that are sent throughout the plant and just disrupting the plant's ability to turn on defense responses. I'm not going to get into a lot of specifics about that. But then uh, plants have these uh, what we call resistance proteins that recognize the presence of these different effectors and turn on uh, a slightly different or more intense defense response in the plant to uh, make them immune. And I should point out pathogens don't just have one or two of these effectors that are manipulating or changing the plant. They can have hundreds. In the case of Phytophthora or late blight, there may be on the order of 400 or 500 different effectors that are all targeting different things within the plant cell. So how do these resistance proteins work? Well, in this analogy, they're, they're a little bit of a more sophisticated 
a surveillance system. Uh, in this case, it may be you know, an alert system, radars, and once those effectors are detected, they're not just calling their neighbors or calling the police, they're calling in the Air Force and the Marines and the Army and really blasting away at, at these microbes. And this is what I like to call kind of new, the nuclear option, right? So these responses in the plant cell can be so strong that it actually kills the plant cell itself. So it's making all these antimicrobial compounds and defense compounds that not only are hurting the pathogen, but they're also hurting the plant cell itself. And this is what we call hypersensitive response. So the plant is overly sensitive to the presence of these microbes or pathogens that they actually give such a strong defense response, the plant cell dies. And these resistance proteins, I mentioned that there are hundreds of different effectors in the plants. Well, there's hundreds of different resistance proteins in the plant. In the case of potato, there's about 750 different putative resistance genes or proteins. And they can detect the presence of these effectors either directly by physically binding them by the, these proteins or indirectly. So they may be working as kind of a guard looking out for the target of the effector within the plant cell. So if it's targeted, it might get changed and these resistance proteins can recognize that something is not quite right and turn on the, the, these defense responses. And something very exciting over the last couple of years, we've actually have some information that shows us what these resistance proteins look like within the plant cell. So in this case, we have a, a pentameric structure where there's five different, different resistance proteins that come together to form this structure when uh, an effector is recognized. And in this case, other resistance proteins form this tetrameric structure. But in both cases, uh, certain regions of these proteins are brought together so that they have some kind of uh, enzymatic function or do something within the plant cell to elicit or signal these, uh, this nuclear option, these defense responses. So why do we need to find and use our gene? So say for instance, we've got an R gene, it recognizes an effector and it turns on resistance. Should be good enough, right? Uh, that's not typically the case. They are nice because they do make the plant more disease resistant, um, should, which means you don't need to use as many pesticides. Uh, the crop stays healthy while you're storing it and you get fewer yield losses due to disease. And they typically have fairly predictable results. So most of them are dominant genetically. You can introduce them into the plant and you know that they'll work. They'll recognize that effector and turn on disease resistance. But I put in parentheses here until they're overcome. So that's an important point that I wanna make that if you have a single resistance protein that's recognizing a single effector, it's relatively easy for that pathogen to change that effector, evolve to change that, or get rid of it entirely so that resistance protein can no longer recognize it. And so what happens in that case, that the pathogen is no longer recognized by the plant and it can go on to cause disease. So even though the resistance protein is there, the plant, the pathogen can still cause disease. And that's what we call overcoming or breaking resistance. And of course you can say, well, let's just put a bunch of different resistance genes in there. And that is more effective, that does work. Um, at some point, if you put all these resistance genes in there, um, they can stress out the plant a fair amount. So we have to find this balance between a single resistance gene and it loading it up with everything we possibly can. And these understanding these resistance genes or finding them is a good way to keep up with, with new pathogen strains. As I say, if they're evolving to overcome resistance, we wanna have an arsenal of resistance genes or proteins that we can use to deploy into new varieties to keep up with that. And of course, what I really like them to use them for is, is trying to understand how resistance works. And the more we understand it, the better prepared we are to uh, avoid pathogens that can overcome resistance. And we'll get more into uh, some experiments or some work that I've done to address that. <laughs> 
So where do we find these R, R genes? Um, I mentioned uh, these wild species relatives of potatoes as, as a great source. And I also mentioned the potato gene bank in Sturgeon Bay. So they maintain all of these wild species relatives, hundreds of species up in Sturgeon Bay. And you can go online, put these species in your shopping cart, and they'll just mail them to you. Uh, for your research projects. And as I mentioned, they are a great source of diversity. They have resistance to a lot of different diseases. These are just some of the different diseases that I work on in, in my laboratory. So I'll, I'll come back to late blight because that's going to be the focus of kind of the rest of, of my talk. Um, and so I titled this the problem with late blight. Well, there's multiple problems with late blight. Um, I want to point out that it's it takes a long time to breed a new potato variety. So if you're trying to, if you've got a wild species that say has resistance to late blight, you want to move that into some potato that we can grow in the field and grow for food. That process can take quite a long time, on the order of 10 to 15 years. And in during that time, you know, the pathogen population is out there in the wild evolving and changing. So even though that wild species source that you used from the beginning had resistance to, to Phytophthora infestans strain Y, after 15 years, Y may not exist anymore. It may be Phytophthora infestans strain M or something is the dominant strain. Um, a good example of this is a cultivar of potato called Pentland Dell that was released in the early 1960s. And people thought it was the solution to uh, all of our late blight problems. So it contained not only one, not two, but three different resistance genes for, for uh, Phytophthora infestans. And it worked for a little while. Um, about seven years. So resistance was eventually overcome by, by late blight um, in 1967. And what was interesting in this work, when they looked at it, they identified, they took all the, the isolates or strains of Phytophthora that were growing on Pentland Dell at that time. And they found strains that were not only able to overcome these three R genes, but a bunch of them, up to 10 different resistance genes, uh, it was able to overcome these. They weren't even deployed. It hadn't even been exposed to them. So presumably, if the, even if Pentland Dell at that point had 10 different resistance genes, there were some strains of Phytophthora out there that would be able to overcome that. And of course, you know, putting resistance genes out there puts a strong selection on the pathogen to overcome that. Uh, more recently, a cultivar called Jacqueline Lee uh, was bred with for resistance to US-1 and US-8 strains of Phytophthora infestans. But I mentioned back in 2009 and 2010, there were new genotypes of Phytophthora that came out. And uh, unfortunately, Jacqueline Lee, which was bred uh, for resistance to these, it was susceptible to these new strains. So what can we do about this? Uh, what are the solutions? Um, well, one, we can keep applying a lot of, a lot of fungicides to help uh, control pathogen populations in the field. That's not necessarily a sustainable uh, way of growing potatoes. Um, ideally, what we'd be able to find is a resistance protein that is able to recognize an effector that Phytophthora can't get rid of or can't change. It's really essential. Uh, it means the difference between this Phytophthora causing disease or not causing disease. And these do exist, and that's what we'll talk about uh, tonight. Um, and then developing a strategy where we can very quickly, on the order of maybe one or two years and not 10 to 15 years, deploy this resistance into new varieties. So the gene I'm going to talk about tonight is called RB uh, for resistance from Bulba castanum. So Bulba castanum is the, the wild species source of this resistance. And it's basically a night and day difference. This is a susceptible plant. And then this is a plant that contains the single gene RB. And it recognizes the presence of this effector called IPIO1. And we've looked at a lot of different strains of Phytophthora, and we haven't found any that, that, are, that don't contain IPIO. And this gene RB was, was cloned by my predecessor in the early 2000s, uh, John Helgeson. He was another USDA ARS scientist in the Department of Plant Pathology. And a lot of my work since I started in 2004 was to, to understand a little bit more how a how this interaction between RB and IPIO 
works. So IPIO is a family of effectors in Phytophthora. Uh, it stands for induced Phytophthora gene O. So people looked at what genes were turned on while, while the pathogen was infecting potato, and they found this one. And there are multiple genes within this family. IPIO 1, 2, and 3 are all recognized by RB uh, directly, um, and uh, they are able to turn on resistance when RB is present. But this other variant, IPIO4, when we put that together with RB, it doesn't do anything. Uh, and so here's an example. Uh, there's more data here than we needed, so I took out some labels, but a couple things I want to point out. So this is a plant that contains the RB protein. So it's being expressed throughout this entire leaf. Um, and we can take this effector, IPIO1, and physically inject it into the leaf. And what we're seeing here is this nuclear option that I'm talking about. This is that cell death resistance response that we see when we have that recognition of IPIO1 by the RB resistance protein. IPIO4, uh, in contrast, we don't see anything. So we inject that into the leaf and we don't see any response at all. Then we did a really cool experiment, or I should say we, a uh, graduate student at the time, Monica Chen, uh, did an experiment where uh, we expressed both of these proteins, IPIO1 and IPIO4, together in the leaf. And what we were expecting to see is that if IPIO4 was not doing anything at all, then this IPIO1 should elicit this uh, nuclear defense response, right? But in this case, we saw that IPIO4 was able to suppress or turn off that resistance response. So in the case that, that came up with a model where um, this RB protein, we know now that it, it forms this uh, multimeric structure, maybe a pentamer like that uh, picture I showed you before. And that structure leads to an active state where it can recognize this effector and turn on resistance. But if this IPIO4 effector is present, it actually physically binds to the resistance protein RB and disrupts its ability to form this active structure. So in this case, it's suppressing the ability of RB to turn on resistance. So that led to a series of questions in the lab. So can we use this information to make RB better? Um, can we use this molecular engine information to engineer a more efficient or more durable resistance gene? So we needed a few things. We needed to be able to avoid suppression by IPIO4 so that um, it can't be turned off. It needs to retain its recognition of IPIO1 so it can still turn on resistance, right? And we need to be able to rapidly deploy it into existing cultivars. So what we did, we went to um, our wild species relatives, because we know they were a great source of diversity and differences in genetic variation. And what we were looking for, since we knew this physical interaction between IPIO and RB was important for turning off resistance, we wanted to look to see if there are any RB proteins in these wild species that no longer interacted physically with the effector. And so I'm not going to get into the specifics of this, but in this case, these are actually yeast colonies that when two proteins interact, the yeast grows. If they don't interact, the yeast doesn't grow. Okay. So we took and uh, isolated the RB gene from a lot of these different wild species, expressed them in yeast with IPIO and looked to see whether they interact or not. What we found was interesting. Most of them do seem to interact, which suggests that all of the resistance, all of the RB proteins in these wild species have at some point been broken by Phytophthora infestans. But we did find a couple, in this case, Pananasectum and Cardiophyllum, that no longer interacted by, with IPIO. So they may be uh, possible that they're not suppressed by this effector. So then we looked at the actual sequences of these proteins, and to make a long story short, we identified these two amino acids in the protein that seem to be responsible for this interaction. So then what we did what most 
molecular biologists would do. Okay, what if we go in and change those amino acids? What effect is that going to have on the resistance protein? So in this case, uh, in this we have our resistance protein RB with IPIO1. So this is exactly like I showed before. We're seeing this recognition and this nuclear uh, cell death response. Um, and which indicates resistance. And in the case when we introduce IPIO1 and IPIO4, just like before, we see the suppression of defense responses. These, uh, these spots in the middle of the leaf there is actually where we injected the leaf. And so they were just damaged by the syringe. Um, but then we took these mutant proteins, so these changed proteins uh, at amino acid 115, we saw that this RB protein no longer recognizes I, recognized IPIO1. So basically, we essentially broke the resistance protein. That's not going to work. That's no good for us. But this other location, RB11, the 117 location, we found that it's still able to recognize IPIO1. And when we introduce it with IPIO4, we see it's still able to elicit a, a hypersensitive cell death resistance response, which is great. So it's still able to recognize IPIO1, but it can no longer be suppressed by this IPIO4 effector. So then when we take that and put it into plants um, using genetic modification, uh, this is the plant with the, the normal RB. We see it's fairly resistant. We do see some disease growing on it, which is typical. Um, this is the susceptible control that's just covered with late light. It might be a little bit difficult to see in this picture. But then this is our, our changed or our improved RB um, that is completely immune. And then if we look at a little bit more of the data, you can see that these plants, all of these, these dots are basically different repeated uh, experiments with the different plants. When we have this RB117 improved RB, we can see that they're quite resistant. We see very little disease in these plants. And they're even more resistant than the, the normal RB plant here. And more, most importantly, when we introduce IPO4, the one that suppresses this resistance, we see these plants are still resistant. All right. So essentially, this is just kind of a summary of what we did. We were able to use the molecular information we, we gained from understanding this interaction with IPIO and RB, and then use the wild species as a source of of variation to try to find pieces of RB that, that may not interact or can't be suppressed by IPIO. Then we move that into uh, a, a new or an improved modified version of RB, and then move that improved gene into potato uh, using transgenics or cisgenics. So essentially, we were able to take the RB protein that we knew was broken or not quite as effective as we'd like it to be, and then modified it in such a way that we can improve it and make it better. All right, so take home messages from, from tonight. Um, I want you to, I, hopefully you understand now that many mi microbes interact with plants constantly, um, but most of these microbes don't do a whole lot. Uh, pathogens, on the other hand, are specialized microbes that use these molecules, these proteins called effectors to manipulate the plant and cause disease. And then plants contain natural immunity that allows them uh, to recognize the presence of these effectors and turn on uh, defense responses. Pathogens then can overcome that resistance. So there's there's this back and forth coevolution or molecular warfare that's going on between pathogens and plants constantly um, that allows pathogen to overcome, plants are resistant, pathogens overcome that back and forth. Um, and these wild species are basically just used to doing that all the time. They're coexisting or co-evolving with these different pathogens. And so they're a great source of disease resistance traits because they're always out there changing and adapting to different pathogen populations. And of course, understanding these molecular mechanisms of a pathogen effectors and host resistance will help us be better prepared to um, you know, keep up with pathogen evolution. So the example I gave tonight was with late blight, but we're also doing work with uh, viruses and uh, understanding how uh, 
they can overcome resistance in potato. Uh, we're also working with other diseases, early blight, alternary uh, uh, verticillium, and other things to try to understand the molecular mechanisms of, of disease resistance in those systems. So one home, one more take home message is, of course, eat more potatoes. Uh, they're, they're good for you. Uh, and it also supports the local economy in Wisconsin, which is great. Uh, with that, I'm happy to take any questions that people might have. All right, we've got a few questions here on Slido. Oh yeah, okay. Go ahead. Thank you for your talk. Sure. Uh, I'm really intrigued by the the difference in time span between how long it takes the pathogen to adapt and how long it takes to introduce a new cultivar. Of right. Data. And it, it seems that you know you can continue to create new resistance genes. But the pathogen is also going to continue to evolve past the gene. So I'm wondering, has there been any work to try to increase the R gene diversity in the cultivar stuff and let them do the work for you um, instead of continuing to play this race? Right. That's a great question. So the question was, you know, can you increase the diversity of our resistance genes or proteins within? The crop to to help avoid the ability of the pathogen to overcome that resistance. So I mentioned Pentlandell and and stacking different resistance genes and and people have done that and it's largely been ineffective. But I think a lot of that is because um, we didn't really understand the molecular mechanisms of that. And so those three genes from Pentlandell may be recognized effectors from the pathogen that it could get rid of, or it could change very easily. And so the population could change. But if we're a little bit pickier about what resistance genes we use uh, and use things, genes like RB, or there are a few others that work like that, that recognize very essential effectors from the pathogen and stack those together, um, the thought is that we can extend that durability of resistance quite a bit longer. There's also been talk about um, you know, using mixed populations of plants in the field. So can you deploy potatoes that are, you know, one plant may have this resistance gene and another plant may have this resistance gene and mix them together so that if a pathogen population comes, comes along that can overcome one, it doesn't wipe out the entire field, right? Um, that's something that people have talked about. It's a little bit difficult to deploy in a lot of production systems because uh, it, you'd have to get the plants that are basically isogenic or they're not different except for that one resistance gene. And that's been difficult to do without using, uh, you know, genetic engineering or genetic modification, which has some, some drawbacks or some, some public perception problems with making or deploying that. All right. So the, do they still do that at Cornell College one course at a time? They, they sure do. Yes, they do. Um, it's, it's something that that um, is a little bit difficult to adapt to, I think. You know, moving to that system uh, from a teaching perspective, I've heard, is a little bit difficult. But um, so it might be a little bit difficult to move back into our normal system after going one course at a time. Do potatoes benefit from mycorrhizae and commercial growing systems in the wild? Of course, yeah, they do. Um, so mycorrhizae are, are beneficial fungi that that's, uh, uh, work with the plant root system to introduce different nutrients and things. And uh, mycorrhizae interact with potatoes quite well. Um, I'm not sure in commercial growing systems whether a lot of the potato growers Use, use mycorrhizae in their systems, but um, yeah, so I'm not, I'm not really up on that, that topic. Um, let's see. What predates oomycetes? Oh, uh, I'd have to look back at the phylogenic tree to see what goes back before that. Um, yeah, I'd have to look that up. I'm not exactly sure on that. Um, 
will this be on YouTube? Yes, it will be on YouTube and you can use it for teaching if you'd like, if you think it's worthwhile. Um, did you use yeast as potato model for solanum tuberosum testing? So the yeast that we used was actually just to look at the protein-protein the protein interactions, but the leaves I showed, actually, a lot of them were not actually potato. They were a tobacco leaf uh, from a wild tobacco called uh, Nicotiana benthamiana. And we like to use that when we're injecting or introducing effectors into the leaf. It's a lot easier to do in the tobacco leaves than it is in potato leaves. Um, they grow a little smaller. It's easier to grow a lot of them. But a lot of the information we use from that translates very well into work into potato. So we kind of use that as our model system. Well, tobacco for secure. Why would you do like um, tobacco? Um, they're smaller. Um, you could use tobacco, I think, uh, but those plants get really huge. Um, and uh, benthamiana are much more compact plants. It's just a space thing. Yeah. Um, does RB gene specify resistance to any other diseases? That's a good question. So I didn't really point that out. Most resistance genes, there are exceptions to this, of course, most resistance genes recognize the presence of a, a single effector from a specific pathogen. There are some examples where these resistance proteins can recognize or confer disease resistance to multiple different pathogens. And likely what's happening in that case, I talked about direct binding. I also talked about guarding different targets of effectors. So in that case, they're probably guarding a protein that is a target of different effectors from different pathogens. It's just an essential target in that case. Um, so there are some resistance proteins that can recognize multiple uh, pathogens. RB is not one of those. Are there any resistance genes from other Solanaceae, not potatoes, um, that could be used for potato breeding? So what's interesting about Solanaceae, uh, tomato, eggplant, pepper, is that uh, some of the genes, a lot of the resistance genes can be transferred between potato and tomato quite easily. So RB actually works in tomato. It can confer resistance to late blight in tomato and vice versa. I, there are tomato genes that can actually work in potato. If you go outside of that family structure, that typically falls apart when you talk about R genes. You can't take an R gene from soybean, for instance, and expect it to work in potato. There are a few exceptions, but for the most part, that doesn't really work too well. Okay, I think that was most of the questions that we had. One slide on. from the house. How close was the uh, varieties that Dr. Helms worked on from global calcium to getting out in the public before the threats of work products happen? So, how closely related is bulbic Is that no. much? How close to Commercial release and new slide farms did that get before uh, the threats of workouts? Um, well, there's actually commercially produced potato that is transgenic that has late blight resistance, it doesn't have RB. I think that's your question is, is you know, has RB been deployed or, or have resistance genes been deployed in this way in potato? Um, and the answer is Simplot in Idaho has released some varieties of potato that have late blight resistance. They also have resistance to cold sweetening, so they don't form sugars that make dark potatoes and chips. Um, but they, they, they're difficult to find. You're not going to easily find them in the grocery store. They're used in some production systems, but not very much. RB and a couple of other genes are being used in uh, deployment for disease resistant potatoes in sub-Saharan Africa. There's a project going on right now um, by a USAID project to deploy disease resistant potatoes in Africa um, and Indonesia and Bangladesh um, using different resistance genes, including RB. Other questions? 
I'm curious about the assemblage of the arching cluster. So you, you mentioned this centimeter structure associated with that. Is it immediately formed or how did how did the commission <laughs> Yeah, I wish we knew. So that's fairly new data, and we're trying to try to understand now. Oh, yep. Yeah. So the question was that that structure of the resistance proteins, that pentameric and tetrameric structure, how rapidly is that formed, um, and does it fall apart? That sort of thing. We're we're interested in learning more about the dynamics of that interaction. We aren't really sure, but it's happens fairly quickly. So. Um, on the order of you know minutes, not hours or days. Once that effector is recognized, it they come together and can elicit defense responses quite quickly. Sorry, say that. So, so once it's formed, is it is it pretty stable for the life of yeah, so the question is once it's formed, how stable is it? That's a question I have, and I I we aren't we don't really know yet. Good question. Yeah, the question about so when you once you have discovered the gene that uh, or you know, use the gene that you previously discovered and found it to be effective in cultivating potatoes, and you publish a paper and it gets out there. After the discovery leaves your lab, what then happens? <laughs> Great question. So, yeah, how how does that? The question was, how does that discovery process work? If I wanted to take RB and make a new variety that contained it, right? That's a long process, and it's a very expensive process because you have to go through a, a very rigorous studies of the impact of that gene on on potato and you have to document you have to identify um, where it goes within the genome make sure it doesn't have an effect on other genes or or the you know how that plant grows that sort of thing uh, and that process can take you know it, it could take a while a year or two to show all that and it takes a lot of money and a lot of research to do that and that's why up until this point Mostly that's been in the hands of industry. So if we have a gene, um, we want it to get picked up by industry who has the resources and then the power and the money and the workforce that can move that forward into some package that could be deployed. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. One more question. Yeah. I grew up in a potato farm up in Michigan. My dad and uncle were uh, fire sick, fire sick, and <clears throat> they grew a hundred acres of russet for base in a two-year rotation of potatoes, oats, and clover. It's 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s. And now all the, all the farms that were in Upper Michigan uh, basically got out of existence. You know, George Rogers died, and nobody could really just face them. And there's no real data that we have there to speak of anymore. You know why? Yeah, well, I think that's just a systemic problem with agriculture at this point. You know, a lot of small farms just dissolve. The family who doesn't want to take over the business anymore, um, and they get absorbed, and you get bigger and bigger farms that produce. Um, I'm not as familiar with Michigan. Michigan has a fairly decent sized potato. Uh, production. Uh, they make a lot of potatoes for potato chips and fresh market and specialty varieties. In Lower Michigan, but not in UP, where, where are you Oh, okay. Yeah, I'm not as familiar with that, but um. uh, Dennis, there's one uh, last question on Slido. Thank you, everyone. We'll see you next week. We will talk on the sixth round of shadow. A lot of shadow as well. Be here.